Thank you. Uh, that's the end of it. If you could start it at the beginning, that's the end of the talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I've got the same London flu that I think half of us have, so bear with my voice. <coughs> so I'm going to just breeze through um, a, a part of impacts that I've become particularly interested in, which is the sort of complexities, oh, thank you, and surprises that we're seeing and what the implications of that are for uh, conservation of biodiversity. So first, we actually, you know, the old meta-analyses that, that I and other people have been involved in use the kind of very, very simplistic assumption that as you get warming, species ought to shift uh, poleward and upward, uh, and spring timing should become earlier, and those series of big global meta-analyses did show that. Overall, you know, about half of species were shifting poleward and upward, and about two-thirds of species were shifting to earlier spring timing. But since those meta-analyses uh, have been published, we're seeing that that category that a lot of us uh, just put as well, we have some counterintuitive changes. We don't know why we're there, but they're a minority, so you know the big picture is still the same. But what we're seeing with more detailed analyses, more sophisticated analyses, is that some of those changes, like downward range shifts, actually can be linked or have been linked to climate change. Uh, we're seeing downward rain shifts in, in relatively dry areas that are now seeing an increase in overall precipitation. That increase in precipitation is allowing species to shift downslope into the formerly too dry um, valleys. And we're seeing east and west changes, again, that are related to precip changes. Uh, winters are warming, and it turns out that that 20% of species that are delaying their timing or showing no change are species that require vernalization. These are fairly uh, northern species. And so they do advance with spring, with spring warming, but they delay flowering or, or leafing out with winter warming. So the observed change we're seeing, or the no change or the delay, is that uh, combination of those two drivers. And so those simple, the big global meta-analyses that made those simple assumptions said, okay, we've got about three quarters of species responding. New analyses, um, and specifically the one that we did for um, Washington DC and UK flowering plants, reveal that when you include this more complex set of changes, 90% are responding to, the, to recent climate change. So we've been underestimating the proportion of species that are being impacted by current existing climate change. And I just want to point out that this vernalization um, issue is, does not just apply to plants. We're seeing this in insects as well, and this is a really good example from Sweden uh, for the orange tip butterfly. So in summary, the, the, the past big global meta-analyses, I think already we're coming up with alarming numbers, but these surprises that have really been coming out in the last five years and the, these complex responses are occurring and most of them at less than one degree centigrade. We're right at about one degree centigrade now. So these past analyses underestimated recent climate change impacts. And the implications of that are, one, that there will be large differences in impacts between 1.5 and 2. <coughs> that is clear from changes we've already seen. Uh, we don't have to look at projections to, to see that. And, and finally, I want to say that successful conservation will be possible, as other people have been saying, when only when other stressors are minimized and when degraded habitats are restored. And the reason I'm coming up with, uh, again, I'm using current existing changes to, to, to emphasize this, and specifically, we are coming up with an increasing number of specific examples, hard, hard cases, where resilience to climate change is very clearly linked occurring only in systems where ecosystems 
are healthy and habitats are undegraded. So, you know, specifically Kino Checker Spot Butterfly in California, the long spined uh, sea urchin in Tasmania, and there are several examples from the Great Barrier Reef. So, again, this isn't projections, this, this isn't modeling, this is actually looking at where have we seen resilience and where have we not seen resilience to recent climate perturbations, and where we've seen resilience, the habitats have consistently been healthy habitats um, on healthy ecosystems. So I just want to reinforce what, what Chris and Nancy um, said in their talks, is that reversing land degradation is not only important for conservation, but it actually could provide a third of greenhouse gas mitigation, and this is an estimate that IPBEST just came out with. Thank you.